everybody, welcome to Word 11, and thanks so much for coming out today. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, Promod Sharma, and the topic is Building Trust with Social Media. Promod started two blogs in 2007 to educate the public and help entrepreneurs market better. You'll find over 401 posts. He expanded to using LinkedIn, podcasts, Twitter, and newsletters. The lessons from these experiments form the basis of this session. So let's welcome Ramon. Thank you. It's always awkward to hear yourself introduced, because that's me. Now, I shouldn't say this with organizers here, but I really wanted to speak at 2.30 a.m., except that spot was already taken, so I hope you don't mind that we're doing this during the day. What we'll be doing in this session is I'll start off with an overview to give you some thoughts on how trust can be used to, or how we can build trust in today's environment. The bulk of this session will be a Q&A. The idea is that this session is for you, so feel free to ask questions, and then we'll discuss them as a group, and then I'll tell you the right answer. And then we'll just have a brief wrap up and get you out of here on time so that you can go to the next session without any delays. Trust. <coughs> Who do you trust? Do you trust authority? So when doctors say, when, when more doctors smoke camels and other cigarettes, then do you think, well, hey, smoking must be good and that must be the right brand? Do you trust celebrity? So this, you can't really see from the back, but it says that John Wayne is a popular, handsome Hollywood star. And he says that smoking is good, and his voice is really important to him. He can't risk throat irritation, so he smokes camels. Uh, forget about how he died, but uh, authority, uh, a celebrity, do we trust a celebrity? What about popularity, right? Statistics saying that more people smoke a particular brand than their next competitor. Those are things that we've looked at in the past, but things have changed. We're in a phase now where Joe Camel has become Joe Chemo. We, we have lots of experiences that are not what we thought they would be. So today, by default, we tend to distrust. So the question that arises is, in this environment, why would anyone trust you or me? We've been burned so many times, the people we know have been burned so many times also. And we need strategies to overcome that. So how does anyone know if you're a joker or an ace? Unlike this hand, there are more jokers in real life than aces. And it's very easy to choose badly, and it's pretty risky to undo the damages. So what's the formula for trust? There are two elements. The first is expertise, and this is fairly easy to, to gauge. So this will be based on your experience, credentials, those kinds of things. The problem is that your competitors often have very similar backgrounds, and so from a client's point of view, they may prefer Coke over Pepsi, but they're not going to walk out of the restaurant if it's not their favorite brand. They have substitutes, unless it's a, an Apple product. So the thing that makes a difference is intent. And intent is something that requires ongoing social proof. And the very best mechanism for building intent is social media. Intent is something you can't really fake for long, because your ongoing actions will give you away. So you need to keep that flame lit, and that takes effort and care. So it's easy to crash, but it's very tough to soar unless you keep providing fuel to keep going. There are two paths to building trust with social media. You can be a parrot, where you repeat things that other people have been saying, or you can be uh, the pundit, where you have your own bright ideas that people come to you for. So we'll start off with the easy way of building trust, and this is by being a curator. So what you do is you are probably receiving information already, and you can like it or retweet it, and then what you're doing is you're passing it on to your network. That's very easy to do, and that's of some value. Then you can start, once you're comfortable with that, you can start posting your own links, and. Uh, summarizing them in 140 characters, which is an interesting experience. And you can use the social media network of your choice. Ideally, you experiment and figure out which environment your prospects prefer. But what you'll see is that since this is easy to do, there isn't really much benefit. Because if you look at this slide, 
it's one that you're not supposed to have, it's all bullet points. So how much time do you think something like that takes to put together? Not a lot, right? So easy to do, a great way of starting. But if you want to get further, then what you want to do is start creating content. That's the more professional way. And here, what you can do is if you're good at talking, you can record your voice, and now you have a podcast. If you're good at showing things, say PowerPoints or just you in front of a whiteboard, whatever it is, then what you can do is record that, and then you have videos that you can put on YouTube. And if you like writing, then what you can do is blog. Now, the next slide has a video clip, and for whatever reason, my speakers aren't that loud, so if you pay attention, I think you'll be able to hear it, otherwise you can go to my website where it has a link. How many of you have a blog? Alright, blogging is free, it doesn't matter if anyone reads it. What matters is the humility that comes from writing it. What matters is the metacognition of thinking about what you're going to say. How do you explain yourself to the few employees or your cat or whoever's going to look at it? How do you force yourself to describe in three paragraphs why you did something? How do you respond out loud? If you're good at it, some people are going to read it. If you're not good at it and you stick with it, you'll get good at it. But this has become much bigger than Are You Boing Boing or The Huffington Post. This has become such a micro-publishing platform that basically you're doing it for yourself to force yourself to become part of the conversation even if it's just that big. And that posture change changes an enormous amount. I, I, I will simply say my first post was in August of 2004. No single thing in the last 15 years professionally has been more important to my life than blogging. It has changed my life, it has changed my perspective, it has changed my intellectual outlook, it's changed my emotional outlook, parentheses, and it's the best damn marketing tool by an order of magnitude I've ever had. And it's free. And it's free. So if you've heard of Seth or Tom Peters, then that short clip might give you some different perspectives on blogging. Because people will also say, like start off saying, well, what if no one's reading it, or like, what if it's just me? And what point they're making is that it really doesn't matter. And we can debate that or discuss that during the question and answer period, but that seems to be one of the things is that, hey, like, I could be a failure. No, you can't be, because you're writing it, and if you're the only reader, you've still benefited from taking your ideas and expressing them to yourselves, yourself in a different way. And if it works for you, it should work for others. So why is blogging your best choice for building trust? First of all, blog posts are very easy to create. You don't really need any special equipment. You can type them out on your phone or your iPad, any device you've got. You don't have to worry about cameras or lighting or makeup and any of those kinds of things. Easy to find. Google is best at indexing text, and that's exactly what a blog is. They're getting better at video and images, but not quite to the extent that text is something they can deal with. And then the last thing is it's very easy to consume. So if you're in the office and you can't play sound because other people are there, well, you can read pretty well anywhere. You can read on pretty well any, uh, on pretty well any device. So those are good things about blogging. Now with blogging, the good thing and the bad thing is that it's very easy to start. So there's a, a brief learning curve. It might take eight minutes or an hour, but it, basically you click on a few buttons and then, wow, I've got a blog, as long as you're comfortable using the templates. And then you write a post and things start happening and then you continue and then the results drop. You say, well, gee, I've, I've done this. I've written three posts, I've written four, I've written five, and I don't have any customers. Like This is just a big waste of time. Well, that's one way of looking at it. But the other way is that you need to keep going. You need to keep pushing, 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 because the real benefits come from continuing. And with social media, what you have is transparency. So the minute you decide you're going to quit, you slide down into the dip, and everyone knows that you quit. You couldn't make it. You couldn't keep going with it. So the real benefits come because it's easy to do, but most people simply do not continue with it. And so there, this is one of those uh, races that you win by staying with it. And of course, your skills improve. When I look back at some of my earlier posts from four years ago, I wrote that, but 
it didn't matter. At least I wrote it. And if I hadn't written that, then I wouldn't be where I am today, which I like to think is bad. Does blogging work? Because that's another question that often arises, is like, prove it. And of course, you can't prove it. And like, I did one blog post, I got these many clients, and it led to these many dollars. But this may give you some ideas. And if you want to know why I started blogging, I blogged about it. So just follow the friendly squirrel to marketingactuary.com, and you can read a, a post from earlier this week. So uh, I've written quite a few posts since uh, I started, and I have two blogs. I'm not necessarily saying this is the right strategy for you, but for me it happened to be. So one is called Marketing Actuary, which focuses on marketing. And that's a hobby, because I like to learn about that area. And so I figured if I'm learning something, I might as well share it with other people. Right? It's like me taking notes, and if I've got the notes on my computer, what use is that to anyone? And if I, my hard drive crashes, I've lost it. Better have someone else store it in the cloud for me forever and get some audiences. And the other one is Riscario Insider, which is related to how wealthy people deal with financial risk. So that's closer to what I actually do for a living. And this is where that got me, just this year. So earlier this year, I was in the Toronto Star, which was kind of interesting. Uh, so the reporter called me and said, would you like to do the interview before or after your photo? I thought, uh, maybe let's do the interview first, because by the time you've heard what I have to say, you won't need to waste the photographer's time. And what she said is, no, I checked you out online. You are the one I want to talk to. Now, to the extent I didn't mess it up during the interview, that was pretty good, right? Because the online presence had led to uh, me being uh, perceived as an authority for what she wanted to cover. So this is what happened in the course of one week. So on Monday, I was on the Toronto Star website. On Wednesday, I was in the Toronto Board of Trade newsletter. On Friday, I was in the Metro commuter paper and website, and the print edition of the Toronto Star, where they compared my Twitter followers with those of a snake that escaped from the Bronx Zoo. And the snake has at least 200,000 more followers than I do. Uh, but I'm not really competing against snakes. So while that was interesting, I didn't think it really took away from what I was doing. I only have a few hundred followers. And then there's this conference I've wanted to speak at for years, except, and I think it would have been good to speak there, but I never got invited. And these are the kinds of people that speak there. So Ted Rogers spoke there the very first year. This year his son was there. And uh, Stephen Harper speaks every year, but this was just the day after the election, so he'd been there eight years in a row, but this year he couldn't attend. You've got people like Robert Cialdini, who's a master of influence. Last year, Mitch Joel talked about digital marketing, and this year I spoke there. And it would not have happened. If it, and it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for social media, right? Because there are lots of people that could have been selected, but I was doing enough. And if you look at my stuff, it's like it's not really amazing, right? I, I'm an actuary. I don't have any. I wasn't given any writing skills, I didn't have a personality, I didn't have any of these things to work on, so if I could do it, then you have a much better chance. And if you're interested in, see, what I did is when I came back from Ottawa, because I, this is as close as I ever got to a TED talk yet, and so I worked on this presentation for like six months, and I knew it as well as I was ever going to know it, and I had no further use for it, because it was just for that audience. And so what I did is I recorded it and I put it on YouTube and I've had, I think, over 150 views. Again, it's not millions, but that's still better than none and the numbers will build up and so maybe someday it'll be over 190 views. Right? And if I wait long enough, it's a possibility. And it's also led to me being here at Word 11. Right? If it weren't for blogging, there wouldn't be much point in me standing here talking about it. Now, you can't force anyone to pay attention to you, not even penguins. You won't believe this, but I paid each of these penguins one bucket of fish each to just stand there and let me take a photo of them. And then when I took the photo, I got it developed, because I don't have one of these newfangled digital cameras that takes like a week to get the film back, this is what I see. So you cannot get people to pay attention. We're paid in two different ways. The first is with attention, and the second is with money. Now these days, attention is extremely scarce. 
we have the same amount of attention as Warren Buffett, though most of us don't have quite as much money, but we have the same amount of time. And you cannot buy attention with advertising as we could in the past. You get it for free with your content. How good is that? So what we'll do now is we'll turn to the discussion part. So please feel free to, to raise whatever questions, concerns you have, and then as a group we'll discuss them and, and see if we can help one another. So, yes? So did you feel that happening to you? Like you, all of a sudden this happened and you knew that it was just going to be wrong? You felt that you Well, what I, I didn't really know what would happen because you I just like experimenting with things. So you were in a different flow. Like you knew that you were succeeding because you could feel it. Yeah, what I saw, and I didn't really expect this, is that when I started blogging, I started changing as a person. Right. Because when you start giving things up, right. It's what Seth calls consistent, persistent generosity. Like you're sharing the best of what you know for free. And if I just Yeah, and somehow it attracts things to you. People can sense that you're different. So that's where I think it ties in with what he's saying, that even if no one read it, you still have changed, and that's something that people can perceive. Yes? Uh, so once, a, once a blog gets to a critical mass, it's starting to pitch its own different uh, care personnel. And uh, the request that you made on the blog that I submitted there trying to uh, bring the public's attention. How do you maintain trust and sort of integrity while dealing with those um, pressures or at least those uh, sources of content? Yeah, that's one of the challenges because if you lose that trust, then what have you got? And in my case, I haven't written about anything that I didn't really buy myself or use myself. Uh, a publisher said that they will send me books if I'd like, and then I can, like, they don't ask me to do anything, but I am more likely to write about one of their books I got for free than someone else's book, but there's really no pressure there. I haven't written about any of the books yet. So it really depends what you're trying to do. So for example, if you look at Seth Godin, like, he just writes, right? So there, he doesn't sell anything in that sphere. If you look at say, someone like Mitch Joel, again, he's just writing. They have other businesses. If you look at someone like Chris Brogan, he seems to cross that line. And it's gotten to the point where I don't bother reading him anymore because he'll have these ones where he makes it very clear that I, I'm, people ask me what camera I use. Well, I happen to use this particular camera, and here's why it's so amazing. And I don't know how much money he makes from that. And he has various links. I don't mind that. So he's, if he's reviewed a book and he says, here's how to get it, or here's a camera I use, here's how to get it. But I, I find that the way I look at it, it's like he's, he's, his disclosure is very good, but it's not quite what I feel comfortable with. So we just need to figure out what we're trying to achieve. In my case, what I'm trying to do is block not so much for money or advertising from people coming to the site, but basically to build trust and share things that I know. And so from that point of view, I don't think I'd be able to achieve that if I we're doing things that were perhaps paid, yes. So why don't you feel comfortable? Do you do an art style, or like why are you not feeling comfortable with it? Um, well, everyone will have their own approach, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with reviewing things, as long as you make it clear that there, there has been some incentive or a free sample or something. Uh, I guess it, it really depends. Do, does anyone else have a, a thought on, on this? On what? Okay. I don't, I don't know why it made me feel uncomfortable when he's reviewing something, but he's like, I guess the thing I understood when he was hard selling it maybe, a little too hard on it, and it wasn't more of a conversation, it was more of a sales pitch. That's what I understood, but is that, I'm trying to understand what makes you comfortable, what is uncomfortable, like where's the line between two? Yeah, ultimately it's really a question of what makes you comfortable, because each of us is different. Like basically what I do for a living is like I'm an actor, so I've only ever worked in the life insurance business. So I used to design products and I saw that they had some pitfalls that advisors didn't really know about. Then I spent about five years helping advisors sell insurance and I saw that the way they were doing it, I didn't really feel comfortable with either. So then I decided that I, about two years ago, that I would uh, review people's insurance, compare it with what they wanted, and then sit down with their advisor and get things fixed. Because you're trying to buy peace of mind and if you don't know what the contract really says. And if you don't know whether you were sold something because the commission was this high versus this high, then how can you have that trust? So in what I'm trying to do 
Because the insurance world, if you look at trust, and I was going to have a slide, but it was just too depressing. If you look at <laughs> trust, it, whatever surveys, you'll find that the medical profession is usually at the top, generally nurses. And then if you look at the bottom, it'll be the financial world, right? So insurance people, investment people, real estate people. And so in that sphere, I didn't want to have anything that I thought could taint me. Now, if you're in a different business, you may have different views. So there's nothing really wrong with uh, doing reviews where you receive products from companies as long as you disclose it. But one of the things is how much money would you actually make from it, right? So if it's just going to be a trivial amount of money, then maybe it's not really worth it. Now, if you could make good money from it and it's part of your business plan, then maybe it does make sense. You had a chance to, you mentioned Chris Brogan who wrote uh, what, Trust Agents and, and you know, just sort of comparing his view of the world, given uh, he owns an email marketing company, I think, uh, one of them, uh, Constant Contact maybe. Compare that with, say, Seth Godin or Tom Peters, whose core business is selling books, for which blogging is a nice entry, you know, I like this guy's writing style, let me, let me find a book. What, um, in, any perspective, like from the Brogan view where his main line of business isn't in the book business? Or for any, it, it sounded like you had followed him a bit. I bought the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yeah, I think the, the book that he co-wrote with Julian Smith is an excellent book. Uh -huh. It's a very good primer for virtually anyone to understand how you can build trust using social media. It's, I think, a year or two old now. It's still quite readable. So I strongly suggest that people do read that book. It gives a very good readable foundation to how to social media can be helpful. People have different business models. So if you look at Seth Godin as an example, he made his millions by selling his company to Yahoo. Right? So he doesn't, unless he invests the way I do, he probably doesn't need to work at all. So he can do things for free. I, I went to the linchpin session, which was last January prior to the launch of his book. And that's the first time I ever had to, to, to talk to him. And the session was basically $25 for like three hours. And I asked him, why was he doing something that cheap? Because, and he said that he could have charged $500, he could have charged a lot more. He's got something in September, which I think the money goes to charity, where he's charging $3,200 for a day for 14 people. Uh, normally he does that for the Acumen Fund. I didn't read the fine print, but it's probably the same kind of idea. So I asked him, like, why are you doing this? And he said that he can. He just wants to cover the cost. And he would be concerned that if someone came there and paid $500 and only got $450 of value, they would be disappointed. But if for $25, you not only get his time for three hours, you also get his book. Like, it's pretty hard to diss that. Right? So uh, I don't really know how he makes his money. I think books are part of it, maybe his paid speaking. But he has a different model. Uh, if you look at Mitch Joel, he does digital marketing, so he talks about various things, but then his company, Twist Image, actually makes money that way. Now with Chris Brogan, he, he's tying what he's doing more closely to what he's doing online. So he is doing some of these other things that maybe other people wouldn't be doing. So again, it really depends on what you're trying to, trying to achieve. Yes? So speaking of different business models, I represent uh, electronics retail, and I'm putting together a blog for them. What are the, well, I, I'm trying to think of concepts to create a social media interaction, to create conversation, but at the same time, the goal is to sell products. The goal is to sell the services. So how do you create a social media interface that's not overly pushy with sales when that is your goal? That's where it gets tricky, because if you tie things directly to your business, then that can turn people away. So you want to get them engaged somehow. So for instance, if I wanted to talk about insurance, I wouldn't have a lot of places to talk. Right? I, I've got some very valuable information I think would be as interesting, at least for me, as what I'm sharing with you here. So that like a very different way of looking at things. But when I tell people I can talk about insurance and trust and related things, no one wants to hear that, even though that would be quite valuable to them. So I had to figure out what would people like to hear about. And I figured that people generally, well, if they're in the business world, want to know about marketing. And that's something I had to learn, because I felt insurance has a lot of advantages that people simply don't know about. 
And if people don't know what's so great about what you've got, you've got a marketing problem. And so normally when I talk to people the last three years or so, it's generally been about social media. I'm not blogging. I normally make, like water it down, saying that, hey, all you need to do is be on LinkedIn and post these updates, basically being the, a curator. And that's still beyond what most people will do. But if, if they even did that, that would be excellent. I really don't talk about blogging, because when you talk to people about you have to actually create content, that's going to take work. That doesn't really work. So you need to see, maybe there's something common about the your target audience that would be of interest to them. And that might work. I Yeah, because the, the option to curate content isn't really going to drive the goal of social media, because the content that we'll curate is Sony's press releases and Panasonic's press releases. And, you, you know, like, that's still really pushing the sales side. To create a conversation about, like, why would you want to install speakers on the wall and hide the wires would be more along the lines of what we're going to try and do for social media. Like, how do we... But I guess the question is, how do you position a conversation when you're the one who starts the conversation and you don't have any audience to speak of? I think as of right now, the Facebook page hasn't even been started officially and there's nine, nine followers and they're all employees. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, how, do you, how do you start from nowhere and start with a culture? Well, tell them how to do it. You yeah. tell them, this is how you put the speakers, this is how you put the speakers, you give them free information. Yeah. And then you got them. To act exactly. as an authority on it. Yeah, and then really when you approach it, sit down, think about your target audience, the type of people who walk into the store, yeah. and I mean, think about it to the point of knowing their, their gender, their age range, the people who walk in, and then look at them as people and say, these are the 10 easy questions that I get asked in a given day. And then take those 10 questions and become the expert, own those questions in the Toronto marketplace. Then when somebody's sitting there and they type Garden Speakers Toronto, not only do they see your sales page come up because your SEO values, but they see these fantastic um, quasi-celebrity blogger articles find you where you talk about the ease of installation. The, but you know the, the thing is, forget the technical. The technical is irrelevant. Right? Instead, focus on how much fun it is for your kids to run around the backyard and add barbecue with these speakers. Because that's all the people really care about. Yeah, I'm going to point out there as well. Um, I think what I do actually in something similar to that idea is um, it's about positioning yourself, right? Because you don't know when that person is going to come in for speakers, right? So you want to make the one time effort that taking three weeks, three months, three years down the road, you've created that YouTube video, right? You have that Facebook group, you have the different things. So it's not about necessarily getting the person today, it's about positioning yourself that when the person needs to solve that problem, you're right in front of their face in order to solve that problem. So kind of think of it like putting your sign right in front of high traffic websites or high traffic areas. Um, so that's how I look at it. There's, there's actually there's been a lot of success with the first generation of the site built around the frequently asked questions on So I, I totally, this actually it all works in line to create an authority on the topic as opposed to coming at it from a marketing perspective, which is where a lot of my like, experience comes from. Marketing but you're not an authority on the topic, so you don't even bring that in. Because there's a million people in the world that can do it. Well, the company that, they want to the do. Company so that I work for. Don't go in with that. I'm going to just go in like this is the information I'm going to share. Because the company share that I work for is a boutique. It is a high-end uh, home theater well, and customer Well, I'm going back to money, right? Don't, yeah. don't relate it to money. Just go in and share what you're going to give. Give it for free. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it. It's like it's going to come back to you. Just give it away. Do what he said. And it's going to come back. It'll come back. Yes, yeah, so I think those points all tie That's in with, with things that would work. That's what you're doing, aren't you? Yeah. So if you were to, for example, it sounds like your business might install speakers like inside walls and things. So if you had posts that explain how to do it yourself, because like everyone thinks, well, I, I don't, but, <laughs> uh, but people may think they can just do it themselves. And so when you explain how to do it, the ones who would do it themselves will still do it themselves. You didn't lose any sales. But the other ones will realize, wow, there's a lot of skill involved in this. It takes a lot of time, a lot of precision, maybe special drill bits, whatever it happens to be. And so maybe we should hire this company instead. 
So you've shared valuable information that's not taking away from you. And then what you're doing is if you do this on a regular basis, you're building up a library. So if you look at Google's strategy, in the beginning, what uh, Sergey was saying is, because if you looked at other companies like Yahoo, they, they had the advertising, et cetera, and they're, tr they're trying to get lots of people on their website today. What he said is he would rather that you came to their website tomorrow than today, or next week than tomorrow, because next, like tomorrow and next week and beyond that, they would be that much better. So if everyone comes to your, your search engine today and say, well, hey, it's no big deal, will they ever come back? But if you go to it and then you tell someone else, well, maybe a few days go by and then they go to it, you're building up that way. So if you start having really good content, then there'll just be more and more of that, and then eventually you become the resource, you've got links to your, your services, and you've got something that could be quite valuable. Yes? So um, how important is it to actually promote that content? Like, I'm writing a blog, but I'm not really comfortable with the whole, you know, twittering or tweeting and promoting it. Like, I, write the, I like the writing part, but not so much, you know, getting it out there. So... Well, it depends. If you're writing for yourself, then what you're doing is fine. You don't need to tell anyone. Maybe some people will find it. But since you've already done the work, there's no harm in letting other people know about it. So if you posted a link on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, wherever it's relevant, then some people will start to find you. A really good way to get started is that, unlike normal business, you try and stay away from your competitors. If you're in a niche, then there'll be other bloggers in that same niche. If you leave comments on their blogs, ideally before you start yours, but whenever, but so you're participating in, in that environment, then they will likely leave comments on yours. When I got started, I was reading a, a blogger called Canadian Capitalist, who is quite well known in the financial world. And when I got started, then I sent a link to this person saying that I've got my blog, and he, like he, in those days, I'm not sure now, like he would list new blogs that just came out, and he listed mine. And that led to my initial surge of traffic of more than like three people. <laughs> <laughs> but that was in part because I had like genuine, this was even before I thought of having a blog, I had genuinely been participating on his blog. So when you've done something for someone, then they tend to do things for you also. That's the reciprocity angle of uh, Robert Cialdini. Yes? Um, is there some kind of etiquette about blogging? Because um, it seems like people have different interpretations of what is um, too much and what is, you know what I mean? Yeah, the question is, is there any... And also, um, like, I noticed that if you have a blog on a website, then Google seems to like the blogs better than the website, and it gets really confusing about all this because there's a business part of it and then there's the fun part about blogging, right? Yeah, so the question is about the etiquette of blogging. Are there particular or ways? guidelines. Guidelines. Yeah. If you want to learn, then you can just do a Google search and there'll be all sorts of information. A couple of good sites would be uh, ProBlogger, uh, Darren Rouse, and another one is CopyBlogger. In the beginning, I read these a bit and then I realized that if I just keep reading what other people are reading, then I'll probably end up writing like other people are writing. Exactly. And then, so after a while, I figured out enough of what I needed to know that I essentially stopped reading those sources. Uh, if I'm looking for something and I do a web search and it happens to go to a, a blog, then that's terrific. But I don't avidly read anyone apart from Seth Godin and Mitch Joel. Uh, and they aren't necessarily telling you how to do your blogging. So I don't know that there's any right or wrong way. You'll eventually have your own voice. And that's why it's good to get started, even though there won't be many readers in the beginning, is you'll discover what the right length is for you. For apparently, Google likes posts that are 250 or 300 words as a minimum. For whatever reason, I find my posts tend to be about 500 words. Now, if I were being clever, I could probably do two posts that were, say, 300 words each, but for me, the one post of 500 seems to be the right length. Other people might write even longer posts or shorter ones. So in that sense, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a matter of just 
trying, and in the beginning you may want to read what others are doing. It's not really a right and wrong, but I meant to end. Like if you have a website, and inside the website you have like three blogs, it gets quite confusing. Because yeah, in a, in a way, it doesn't really... And the traffic and the, and, the, and the keywords, it really gets hard to figure out. It seems like it's all going to the blogs. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, well, if you can get traffic, then that's good. Then the question is, where do you redirect that traffic? Yeah. And so, for instance, I find that some of my posts that are still the most popular are ones that I wrote three, four years ago. Like, there's one about, does Warren Buffett, if you put Warren Buffett in the title, that's a good strategy. <laughs> does Warren Buffett buy term and invest the difference? Because that's one of the like, misconceptions that people have is that he would do that. But he's a value guy. He buys things that you can keep forever. Term insurance, you can't. It runs out. That's one that still gets read every day. Another one is, uh, I'm a fan of the seven habits of highly effective people. So I had various quotations I had that related to each of the habits. So I posted that. And I still have daily readers. So I'm getting traffic. And that was stuff that I just had on my computer before, right? And so it was of no use to anyone else. I put it there. And I've had like thousands of people reading those things. So now I'm getting traffic. And when you have traffic, then they can click on other things too. So I don't know that it matters whether everything is on one site or different sites. The fact that people are paying attention to something can lead them to pay attention to other things if you have links to those things in proximity. Other questions? Yes. I'm a content writer, but my blog is really about a lot of international marketing. It's one of them, customer experience. Uh, I'm doing it this way because my site's being redeveloped, but I probably would continue to want to write about everything that interests me, which is quite good. Is that a flaw strategy or is that okay? When I first started, I was writing about whatever interested me, and I have a wide range of interests. And then, this may have been from reading one of these blogs on how to blog. Uh, what I realized is that someone would have no idea of what to expect when they came to my blog. So unless I was a celebrity where people just wanted to know whatever I happened to be thinking of at the time, uh, I realized that wouldn't be good. So my original blog was called Spark Insight because I just had such a wide range of interests. And I realized that I needed to focus. Ideally, I should have just had one blog, but I had these two divergent interests. One was marketing, uh, so that's where, that's where I got the Marketing Actuary blog, and the other one was related to financial risk, which is my expertise. So I have those two. So each, I write one post per week in each of them, because I don't really have time to do more. So that's about a thousand words a week for four years, so that's a couple of hundred thousand words from that point of view. A better strategy would probably be to have maybe one blog on your core topic, and maybe another one that's whatever. And, or maybe just have one blog and just have more posts rather than multiple blogs. It really depends on your, your interest, but someone, if I came to your blog, then I may not have a sense of what it's about. Now, to the extent that I found your blog through Google, it doesn't matter because you were seen as an authority in whatever I wanted. But in terms of building an audience, it may be difficult unless it's people who happen to know you personally. You said the weekly approach is best from a, a, just a time management perspective that you, like weekly blog posts, because I have started a blog like many people, but on these other priorities, it's, you know, it, it's a stack blog of a handful of quality posts. Um, it's the time question that, that holds me, and probably a lot of people back. How do you handle that? Well, since I don't really know how to write, I probably take longer to write than I should. Uh, and maybe I should take some course on it. So a blog post will take me probably, let's say, around three hours. So the way I look at it, and I'm writing two, right? So basically, I'm devoting about a day to blogging per week. And that day is called Saturday. <laughs> the way I look at it is that I feel that I'm here to help other people and share things. I have this reluctance to donate money because I always worry about how it'll get used and yeah. all these things. So the way I looked at it is that someone like Warren Buffett could donate a million dollars or a billion dollars. I can't quite match that. Yeah. But he has the same number of hours that I have in a week. So if I'm donating time, like say a day a week, to essentially trying to help people to the extent of my abilities, then that's my donation. 
So I look at it from that point of view rather than here's a marketing strategy or a return on investment kind of thing. So it depends on why you're blogging. If it's your passion, uh, then that's one way of looking at it. It's easy to find time if you cut back on distractions. There is a fascinating book from a few years ago called The Four Hour Work Week, Timothy Ferris. And in theory, I think it would be very tough for us to get down to four hours, but it's more of an aspirational statement. And what he says is just cut out media. So he said that he doesn't really read the papers, he doesn't uh, follow the news in general. So I thought, that's interesting. And so about two or three years ago, I tried that. Because I, I was, what I thought is that when I go around, like, people will ask me about current events and they'll realize how clued out I am. But I thought, let me try it. And so I stopped, like, and I've been at it for, I don't know, two, three years. But I don't read the newspaper. I don't listen to the radio. Uh, I really, look, we don't have TV anymore. So there, that saves hours and hours and hours of time. And in terms of social media, I find that it's easy to get, to get engrossed and diverted. So I primarily focus on LinkedIn. And that's about the only one I have enough time to manage. And then I spend time on the blog. So I think that for about a day a week, most of that is me donating my time the way I look at it to help other people. And so I'm using a different part of my week than my work week. So it depends on what you're looking at. The ideal would be to, uh, the, the, the tool I found most effective for writing is actually my iPad. And I never had an Apple product before. I despised Apple products, Windows, World, et cetera. But the business case was so compelling that I decided I would get one. Because it's very good for point of sale things. When you show people things on an iPad, it's different than here's a computer. And there's an application, and of course I've written a blog post about this, how to write better, faster. Uh, but there's an application called IA Writer, which is designed specifically for writing. And it eliminates all the distractions. So, because on your computer you've got all these other things going on, notifications, but you've got a full screen, and it's got a particular font that's designed to be easy to read, but it's designed so you can't read too fast. And so it makes it easy for you to spot your mistakes and things. And it's, it's kind of like a career font, but it's just perfect for writing. And so I find that it just makes me feel like writing. Before I would take a little piece of paper, like a five by eight piece of paper, yellow with lines, and if I had bullet points on, though I think white paper would probably work too, I haven't tried. But if you write on, I found that if I wrote bullet points on both sides, then by the time I converted that into a blog post, that would be probably around 400 to 500 words. But it would take time to take what I wrote on paper and get it in the computer. When it's already in a, on a device, then it helps. So there may be something like that. Some people say they like using special fountain pens or journals or different things. Uh, so different things may work for you. I yes. can comment on that. Oh, okay. uh, I've had a lot of success. I went down to the Consumer Electronics Show and reported that and because I was like doing the trade show all day and then going back to the hotel room to report on it at night, I brought down a microphone and I used Dragon Naturally Speaking. Now, there's a lot of errors that come up in that. When you, when you use a speech to text software, it's a pain in the butt and you've got to learn how to speak to it. You actually have to talk like a computer for it to respond well. Uh, take your time and enunciate each word. But what I found was, is that I was able to like bang off an article in 20 minutes by taking a look at some of the pamphlets, going over the notes that I had taken in the day, and just kind of like starting a conversation. And then that's like your first draft. Then you need to sit down with that article that you've spoken out and really trim it up, get your points in order, get the punctuation and spelling, and get the right words in the right places, and spend another hour, hour and 20 minutes proofreading. But that's two hours to create a 500 word blog post, as opposed to the three hours if you're sitting down to get your notes out. It takes the, the notes I guess, because I can remember sometimes I wouldn't have a full idea for the article, mm -hmm. so I just kind of like spout out a line of information like, and the speakers are this, and, and then when I go back to edit it, you've got your points in there. It takes the go from paper, like from ideas to paper to the computer, it takes a paper out of the equation. Right, and that's an idea like I got from Pro Blogger because he would he said he had all sorts of text files on his computer because I thought when you started writing you needed to finish it, but they were partially completed and then he'd go back to them when it was relevant. 
So we have time for one final question. I just want to ask you a question. It may be a controversial question. Maybe oh, not. great. Right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to be a writer to be a blogger or to truly uh, build a community? Isn't well, that what it's all about? Like you're writing stuff, you're like almost like a... Uh, there seems to be a split between like people who really know how to write who think there are certain ways to do it and then amateurs. And I just find that you, as you write, you start getting better at it. So I don't know that you need any particular skills. You are writing. You have a video blog. Yeah. Yeah, then that's... You become a writer then after. You are writing. I mean, to me, a writer is someone who is writing things. So to wrap up, essentially what you're doing is you're creating a digital tapestry with everything that you do that remains visible online. So in the beginning it'll be crude, but as you keep working on it, it'll become more and more refined, right? So what happens is, in the beginning, you've got something that looks very crude like this. No one can really see what's inside you or where it's going to lead, but as you keep at it, you do get better, and eventually you uh, end up with something that's beautiful. One of the concerns that people often raise, though none of you did, so I shouldn't raise it, is what happens if uh, you write something that people don't like, or you, you're out of character, or you've got your drunk pictures on Facebook, and no one's going to hire you, those kinds of things. Well, if you do more and more things, then if you've only done 10 things online, and one of them isn't good, then you've got a problem. But if you do so many things, then the little mistakes get buried, right? We're understanding of people, but if there's but you need to have that presence so that people can see what you're about. So thank you so much for attending this session. I'll be here all day. I'm not planning to stay overnight because I was not allowed to speak at 2.30 a.m. Uh, so I'm happy to chat with you and stay in touch. And best wishes. And good